In addition to hypothermia, acidosis, and coagulopathy, aka the lethal triad, did you know that there's a fourth variable that's been associated with an increased risk for death in trauma patients in hemorrhagic shock? Calcium is the most abundant cation in the human body and is responsible for regulating the skeletal, muscular, as well as nervous systems together with cell as well as vascular permeability. Calcium-dependent pathways are key in maintaining vasomotor tone, platelet function, as well as cell-based coagulation, and therefore plays a huge role in patients who are in hemorrhagic shock and resuscitation. Hypocalcemia is extremely common among injured patients, and classically, the traditional explanation was this. Patients who were receiving red blood cells, which are bathed in citrate, that citrate tends to bind to calcium, resulting in hypocalcemia. But there's much more to hypocalcemia in trauma patients than meets the eye. In addition to transfusion-related hypocalcemia, there's also what's known as trauma or injury-related hypocalcemia. In a number of retrospective studies, both civilian as well as military, the incidence of hypocalcemia in injured patients arriving to the emergency room even prior to receipt of a packed red blood cell was 55%. By the time bleeding trauma patients are undergoing a massive transfusion defined as greater than or equal to 10 units of RBCs within a 24-hour period, more than 97% of these patients will manifest hypocalcemia and three-fourths will have severe hypocalcemia defined as an ionized calcium level less than 0.9 millimoles per liter. As such, there really needs to be a bit of a shift in terms of our conceptual approach to hypocalcemia in trauma patients, similar to acute traumatic coagulopathy, which is oftentimes related to endogenous or injury-related factors. Then you have the trauma-induced coagulopathy, which is similar to the transfusion-related or induced hypocalcemia that we see in patients who are receiving blood and blood products. The finding of hypocalcemia in trauma patients is associated with the need for transfusion, massive transfusion, as well as mortality, particularly at the extremes of either hypo or severe hypercalcemia. So what's the interplay between hypocalcemia with acidosis, coagulopathy, and hypothermia. Among patients who are hypothermic, defined as a temperature less than 35 degrees Celsius, we know that the liver is slower to metabolize citrate, which results in increased circulating levels of citrate, which then binds calcium, resulting in hypocalcemia. With regards to coagulopathy, we know that calcium is a critical cofactor necessary for clotting. Hypocalcemia is also associated with a lower pH or acidosis, and we also know that a lower pH prolongs clot formation. I would strongly recommend reading this great review paper out of Raleigh, North Carolina. In this paper, they do talk about some of the recommendations with regards to hypocalcemia treatment per the Joint Trauma System, who released a recent CPG on damage control resuscitation. In general, for patients in hemorrhagic shock, they should get a gram of calcium after their first unit of blood and consider giving another gram for every four units of RBCs transfused. In general, when available though, we do want to be monitoring ionized calcium levels and typically do want to treat once they fall below 1.2 millimoles per liter. With regards to what type of calcium you should be administering, calcium chloride versus calcium gluconate. In general, calcium chloride contains three times the elemental calcium than calcium gluconate. And because it's already in its ionized form, it will improve or result in a higher increase in your ionized calcium level. Again, it's nice to have central access because if calcium chloride does extravasate outside of a peripheral vein, it may cause surrounding tissue necrosis. How are you managing trauma patients with hypocalcemia at your trauma centers? Be sure to like and follow for more.